Jesus Christ died for his sins. I think that his children, Rufus and Alexander, learned that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And that's how they know them. And all the church around the world knew these three men, Simon and his two children. It's also interesting, and this is another thing, a reason I think Mark puts this detail in, is that these three names, Simon is Hebrew, and Rufus is Latin, and Alexander is Greek. Now, God, in his wisdom, likes to shove those kinds of things at us. He says, I am a God of everybody. I'm not just the God of the Hebrews. I'm not just the God of those who speak Latin. I'm not just the God of those who speak Greek. I'm the God of everybody. And Mark is just reminding us in this very subtle way that God is going out into the entire world, that Jesus Christ is dying for the sins of everyone. And he reminds us again that he is there, not just for the sins of nice people, not just the sins for, of our people, not just you know our little family, our little circle, our little righteous group. He died for the sins of everyone. They take Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. I don't know that it looked like a skull. I don't know if they found skulls there. I don't know if it was just a place of death. But it was a very public place. A place where lots of people would walk by just to get into town. And so they crucified Jesus at the place of the skull. Now, everyone knew in Jesus' day what crucifixion was all about. They didn't need you to draw a picture. Because the Romans made sure that you knew what crucifixion was all about. And so Mark really gives us very few details. But the details that he does give are very important. And really, he doesn't go into the gruesomeness of the nails or, or the pain in the back or how people looked on the cross. He just says they crucified Jesus. But he gives us some details that he wants us to know, not because it makes it a better story, but because we need to learn from them. It talks about first that they gave Jesus, or tried to give Jesus, some wine mixed with myrrh. This was a narcotic. This was a pain deadener. And they gave this to prisoners. They gave this to people who were going to be executed. I don't think because they were compassionate. You know, I think they probably gave it like you'd give somebody Red Bull. Give them a little more energy. Give them a little more, you know, oomph. We want to see him die longer. You know, we want to see him suffer more. And so I think they were offering this to Jesus so that Jesus would hang there for a long time and they could enjoy this sport of crucifying someone. Well, Jesus rejects the offer of wine. He has told us during the, the scene at the Last Supper that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until we all get to heaven. Wine was a symbol of blessing and joy and prosperity, and, and Jesus is saying, there's going to come a day when we're all going to get together, and we're going to have some, have some fun. But he also said that he is destined to drink the cup of God. This is the cup that really he is drinking on the cross, as a symbol of all the suffering, all the pain, all of the torture that God had destined him for, so our sins would be forgiven. Plus, I think Jesus is saying, I'm not going to go to sleep on the cross. You're not going to numb this pain like the disciples were numb and fell asleep in the garden. I'm going to be awake for all of this, knowing what God is doing in my life. Knowing exactly what God is accomplishing on the cross. Mark also mentions the division of the garments. Not because it happened. It happened a lot. This is just part of the spoils of war. The guards who, who did the job got to keep the, the possessions. But Mark includes it because of Psalm 22, where it says that they were going to divide his garments among them. A thousand years before Jesus died on the cross, David wrote that the Messiah would have his garments divided up among them. It is absolutely amazing to me. It's a thousand years before Jesus Christ died. David prophesied this. He talked about crucifixion. He talked about being hung on a tree. He talked about them dividing his, his garments. A thousand years. And it all came true. And Mark wants us to know that. This was not something that just happened. It wasn't just out of God's control. This was consistent with what God had wanted to have happen in this world. We need to understand that. When bad things happen to us, when children are born deaf or without feet or, 
you know, horrible things happen. We need to know that, that suffering is consistent with what God has asked us to do. He is going to redeem it. He's going to change it. He's going to fix it one day. But in the meantime, it is all under God's control. He has it under his control. And we need to understand that. We've also read about Jesus' garments throughout the book of Mark. He, Mark has talked about Jesus and his, his clothes before. Earlier, we talked about a woman who had believed that if she just touched Jesus' clothes, she would be healed. And it happened. It came true. At the Mount of Transfiguration, his clothes were transformed into something that was brilliantly white. We've seen Jesus' garments before. Just a couple weeks ago, we talked about the soldiers putting a royal robe on Jesus, proclaiming him this bogus king, focusing on Jesus' garments again. And so here we have this person who has tremendous power, who shows himself the transfigured son of God, being publicly humiliated in the most horrible way possible. And Mark drives that home to us. Mark tells us that he is the, the accusation against Jesus was put on a plaque on, on top of the cross, and it said he's the king of the Jews. Jesus, throughout the book of Mark, throughout all of the Gospels, denies that he is a political figure, and yet now they're crucifying him as a political figure. You know, he said, this isn't why I have come this time. This time I have come as a savior, someone who would sacrifice his life, and they still crucified him as the Messiah. He is the king of the Jews. And whether they recognize this or not, that's exactly who he was. He didn't look like any kind of king that they'd ever had or ever wanted to have. But this kind of king was the kind of king that would suffer for them and die for them. The kind of king who would give everything that he had to love his people and show himself for his people. He's crucified between two terrorists. He wasn't a terrorist. He was in the temple every day, and they arrested him as a terrorist. They came after him as a, as a, a terrorist in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, and then they hung him between two terrorists. This is what the world perceived Jesus as. This shows what, uh, exactly what he's going to have happen. And Mark tells us again that this was according to Scripture, according to prophecy. Now, Mark, during this entire story, tolls the hours. He rings those bells in our lives, in, in that day. In the third hour, they crucified him. In the sixth hour, darkness descended over the, over the land. In the ninth hour, when Jesus cries out, it is the hour of prayer. And he cries out, why have you forsaken me? I think that is the basic prayer that we have, the basic need in our life. We know that we have been forsaken, and we go to God in prayer, and he answers us. Maybe not that day, maybe three days later, but he answers that prayer of Jesus on the cross. Then they start to mock him, and they pray, say all kinds of things on him. Some people just like to watch other people suffer. You know, it's just fun. Let's all slow down at the car accident and go, what's going on? Uh, you know, I don't know if they like to watch people suffer or what, but there are people here that like to watch people suffer. Some of them were criminals, some of them were priests. Mark is saying everybody, from the people who are considered lowest in society to the people who are considered highest in society, are all mocking Jesus and yelling things at him. It says that he hurled insults at him. And the word there is the same word that we use for blasphemy. Sometimes, it, you know, if it was just used in a, in a context where you didn't like the person, well, yeah, it was an insult. But if you insult God, then it becomes blasphemy. Well, Jesus was accused of blasphemy. This was one of the charges against him that the high priest brought him against him. You have blasphemed God. You have set yourself up equal with God. You say that you are here to judge us. And that's, the high priest thought that was blasphemy. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. I am here to judge you. And if you don't accept that, that is blasphemy against God. Who is really the real blasphemer in this story? It's the person who doesn't recognize who Jesus Christ is and turns their back on him, and denies him. Jesus is obedient to God's will. That is the essence of his life. They unknowingly challenge him to disobey God's will. People who disobey God's will are actually the blasphemers. 
Obedient people are actually those 